You know, I'm just going to start this talk with a bit of personal kind of perspective on this issue. And it may or may not resonate, but I am a little bit suspicious of loyalty cards. <laughs> and I am kind of somewhat uh, nervous about bank cards also and Snapchat. <laughs> so Snapchat, for example, a Snapchat user can turn off their location and they can still see your location. I mean, if you don't manage your privacy settings. And it just seems a bit creepy, which sort of brings me back to loyalty cards and bank cards. <laughs> so my loyalty card can, knows when I shop, where I shop, what I buy, how much I am prepared to pay, how much I am prepared to travel. Uh, it knows a fair bit. And I feel like that uh, that's good for them. So there's advantages in product placement and price points. Um, but I haven't noticed that shopping is any more enjoyable, <laughs> any easier or any cheaper. And I think in some ways, uh, this is potentially how some producers feel about their data. So I'm going to talk to you about the Accelerating Precision to Decision Agriculture Project, which I will now call the P2D Project. We started this project around about two years ago, um, where RDCs kind of saw a signal that you know, digital transformation was real and big and a big step change for producers. And at the same time, we saw really vibrant marketplace, lots of investment overseas, people looking at Australian ag tech. And the question that we asked were, what were the underpinning enabling factors that allowed ag tech to thrive in Australia and allowed producers to capture value from their data? And so we're very, not looking at creating market solutions, but creating um, an operating framework that enabled market solutions to thrive. And as Rowan said, importantly, it is the first time that all 15 RDCs have come together on such, a, and it is such a strategic agenda. Um, and I'm just really going to take you through what we've found and what the project has shown us um, are important things to do. So we worked with six, this by the way is how we held our meetings. This is a Zoom meeting with people from all over the country in many different, <laughs> and none of them know that I took this photo, so sorry <laughs> if you're in the room. <laughs> um, so we worked with six um, research organisations and I'll just run through what we did and what they did. We have CSIRO who surveyed producers' needs and aspirations around um, digital tech and some of the barriers to adoption. We had uh, Griffith University and Uni University of Sunshine Coast looking at um, legal barriers, privacy, trust. We had University of New South uh, New England looking at um, telecommunications, data connectivity, at Data61 looking at our data sets, you know, what kind of data assets does Australian agriculture have? And we also had let me just check, uh, yes, Data to Decision CRC, um, which really looked at the way our data should be managed in terms of systems and architecture. So what we found is that the digital maturity of the sector is relatively low. Now, I want to stress, because uh, it's not, you know, not terrific, but um, not particularly unique to this sector and not particularly unique to this country. I mean, many sectors, digital literacy is low. It is just really um, because of where we are in, in time. Um, we also found, though, that with maturity, there is significant economic benefit potentially from digital ag. And we've made some recommendations uh, for all RDCs or the whole sector to work together to try and realise these gains. So just a bit of a snapshot of um, digital ag today or as we found it in Australia. Um, 
looking at Mark here. Yeah, so the, in terms of the digital maturity being rated as low, we found issues around um, digital literacy, which we've, we've heard about today, grower trust of data and data service providers, uh, the, avail the availability of appropriate data within this country for this sector, and um, that the lack of access to telecommunications, as we've heard, is a major barrier to adoption but nearly all producers collect data, so something is over 90%. Um, mostly, though, that can be held in paper form or on desktop computers, rarely on the cloud. Um, we found that producers find their data useful. Uh, they, f they see it to add profit to their enterprise. And also, if the more that people interact with their data, the more useful that it is for their business. Produ uh, we also found that farm data is not necessarily big data and it's not necessarily always in great condition as, for example, sensors aren't calibrated and so on. And there are businesses today that make a living on cleaning ag data. Um, producers are generally happy to share their data although they have particular concerns around privacy, protection of their privacy, and, and particularly concerned about others profiting from their data. Safety was the number one driver of data communications on farm, and because of this mobile, and because of this, and because it's relatively easy to use, we found that mobile phone-based telecommunications dominates. It was over 55% of producers have mobile phone coverage to their homestead. Beyond the homestead, it was patchy or non-existent. But for those two reasons, because safety was a driver and because it's easy, we perceive that mobile phone-based telecommunications it was li is likely to dominate in the future. But digital literacy was low. For example, 75% um, of respondents rated it moderately to extremely challenging to maintain on-farm telecommunication systems. 53% had taught themselves and 61% knew little to nothing about available options. So it just goes to show, you know, really technically difficult and complex area and with quite an immature service sector. So the money. So we did find that with maturity um, that the economic potential is pretty high. So we used a general equilibrium model and assumed that digital agriculture would give you all the data you need to make every management decision right. So if you think about, in very simple terms, the genetics by environment by management framework, we're assuming that digital ag takes out all management errors, and we also did not include cost of adjustment to that. Um, so we used, was, the data was on the basis of benchmarking studies and expert um, interviews, and we've modelled that the implementation of digital ag across all Australian production sectors as represented by the RDCs, uh, could lift gross value of ag production, which includes forestry, fisheries, and aquaculture, production by 20.3 billion, which is a 25% increase on 2014 levels. So the size and type of potential benefits vary from one industry to the next. But all industries are set to make gains from, overall, from the overall production increase. And just highlighting, we pulled out what were the sort of top areas of benefit across the sectors. So cross-sectorally, the four um, key areas were savings through labour and automation. And that is not just um, automated tractors, which you know people sort of automatically go to, but it's also things like autofill of forms, you know, automatically filling regulatory compliance forms, that kind of thing. Um, so tailoring inputs like fertiliser, seed and water. 
increasing market access and biosecurity. So biosecurity was you know, really high for every industry and benefits really could be, the benefits could be realised from something like a digital platform used to um, predict and manage bi uh, um, biosecurity incursions. And boosting genetic advancement. So integrating genetic and genomic data with lifetime productivity data and objective carcass management in the livestock industry, for example. So we, did, we found a need to increase grower confidence in the return on investment and alleviate confusion around the best options for individual farms and businesses by showing that investment in digital ag will pay off. And we are seeing some spectacular results from early adopters. This is an example from Sundown Pastoral Company uh, property Kita, an irrigated cottons and grain uh, property west of Moree, where they have invested to um, extend, extend the mobile network from Moree, basically, out to the farm and then connect a Wi-Fi network within the farm. And last year, you probably all heard this, but they held the largest agricultural auction in Australia on Kita and with 600 registered bidders, but importantly, 35% of the equipment was sold online. So if you're there this morning, the Minister announced that we have uh, developed some tools for producers and we have them all online. We've developed um, a grower toolkit which basically helps you navigate some legal issues around privacy, unfair contracting terms and mandatory reporting of data breaches, for example. We've pulled together a register of all Australian data and decision support tools, and we have developed a reference architecture. So reference architecture, I don't know, but when I first heard the term, not what it means. <laughs> but essentially, it is a way to design a software system, and it's a principles-based approach, and it's a way to try and solve these interoperability issues we're seeing in the field between various proprietary models. It simply sets some high-level principles that if everyone designed their software, software according to these, in theory, those operational issues would be resolved. So yeah, I encourage everyone to go and have a look at those. Um, those and the report are on the CRDC website and there is a summary report and a, a huge amount of uh, technical detail reports. And the contacts for all the researchers are on that website as well. So now to the recommendations. We've made 13 recommendations. So essentially P2D can be seen as a scoping study to identify what we need to do. And we have identified 13 activities that we believe, um, if they're undertaken, they will boost both the adoption of digital ag on farm in a meaningful way that increases farm profit. I'm just going to go through these five key areas, so policy, strategy, leadership, digital literacy and enablers. I will just go through those five key areas. So policy, there's four specific um, policy recommendations, but essentially good policy is real at the national scale for the sector is seen as a really important first step just to set the rules of the game and essentially so that we have um, a system set up so that the rules advantage Australian producers and enable a marketplace that is consistent and fair um, yeah, a bit more sort of coordinated. <laughs> so we have a recommendation to develop a data management policy with the guiding principles for the control use of data. We have a recommendation to then investigate things like codes of practice, certification or accreditation, but essentially measures to promote and encourage best practice contracting or, and fair terms for ag data, products and services out in the field. Thirdly, to develop new policy and investment models to improve telecommunications to farms and rural businesses, including, for example, wireless backhaul infrastructure and multi-point NBN satellite points to rural properties. 
and to explore and implement new public and private investment models which facilitate data exchange, including things like open standards, open data, and integrating private data into foundational data sets. So strategy was seen as really important for the RDCs to set a strong North Star vision and then just design an implementation plan to get there, which essentially just means where are the benefits going to be realised in the sectors and how do we organise investment and effort to get there. Given the fact that this is just moving at such a rapid pace and so the strategy is really just to coordinate that so we can keep pace with the rest of the world. So we have three recommendations. One, to develop digital ag strategies, as I said, for the sectors and implementation plans. Secondly, to, roll, to, to finish developing the reference architecture and, and roll it out and um, sort of drive practice change. And thirdly, to, and, and no mean feat, <laughs> that to establish, review and refine foundational data sets for agriculture, including things like soil, water, climate. So really importantly, leadership is seen as a critical um, element of this digital transformation because digital, it, is, it is really moving, it's just the way we do business. It's not necessarily what we do, but we're definitely going to do things differently. So we're going to be living in a digital world and um, leadership is just really seen as important to guide that through because obviously change can be bumpy. So there are, there's two leadership um, groups recommended. One is a task force with a chief ag, uh, digital ag officer, and one is a working group. So that the task force is to implement outcomes and the working group is just to guide decisions. So this is not a new concept and in fact the federal government has it in other portfolios. Uh, there's a small business um, digital task force set up recently with similar goals is to help small businesses um, you know, stay abreast of the digital economy and make the changes they need to make in their businesses to stay and, and in fact increase productivity. As I said, digital literacy um, was a, was a, it is a big barrier and it, it is digital literacy from the paddock to the boardroom to the, to the laboratory. So we really do need to build new skills and capacity in this sector. And, and if you go back to the slide about automation, yep, we, we are going to definitely see a shift in our workforce and we will lose some um, roles, but we have a very fledgling service sector in data ag products and services. And um, you know that really needs to increase. So we, I've lost my spot. We are recommending that, yeah, we both increase digital literacy generally throughout the sector, but also build data capacity within our research group. And we need to, we, uh, there's a strong sense that sort of exemplar farms of what is currently best practice and how do you adjust to a digital world is seen as a really uh, useful way of helping to demonstrate to producers the value, what, what changes need to be made and what the value can be gained. This, by the way, is a producer in the southern growing, near Griffith, a cotton farmer, who's just automated his irrigation so he no longer has to get up at night. Although I did see his wife tweeting that she got up the other night, so clearly some teething problems. Hey? Yeah, he didn't get up. <laughs> Uh, and then finally, just three quite specific enablers, which are seen as, you know, not easy things, but, but definite areas of value proposition that we can just get on and do. And so one is to establish baseline patterns of data usage and a mob national mobile uh, network. So this is a bit like, um, you know, if you Google Woolies, so you know what load is on that infrastructure at what time, so you can schedule data movement, that kind of thing. And there are similar apps that help you um, manage your mobile signal already. Secondly, to digitise and automate data collection for regulatory compliance activities. Oh, I'm not going to click that link because I didn't try it. But, you know, it's just like autofill, which we see happen, you know, when you go shopping online, um, just being able to autofill a lot of the form filling. 
And finally, to sort of benchmark this over time, so to, to, comp to continue to see where the movement is and where the barriers are so that we can focus investment. So in terms of next steps, I mean, this, is, this, this, I mean, this isn't about the action of individual producers, not what I'm talking about. It is, but stay, because staying ahead of the game will require some major changes. And every RDC is very conscious of the size and complexity of this task and the need for cross-industry cooperation. On a practical level, by looking at best practice overseas, we've realised that we must combine our spending power to attract market solutions that meet industri Australian industry needs. And on a strategic level, we need the collaboration to provide that strategic leadership. So if we want to keep pace with the rest of the world, we can't look for solutions within the parameter of an individual industry. And so to this end, the RDCs have agreed on the intent to work together to invest in the recommendations which require investment and to support the, the establishment of the leadership groups. So just to bring it back to me um, and my loyalty card, so I am a pretty busy working mother. By the time I have dropped my kids off at the wrong spot, on the wrong time, looked sideways at my husband, arrived at the wrong meeting on the wrong day. By Friday, I am lucky if in my fridge there is a glass of wine. But I just wonder, with all that data that I'm sharing with my loyalty cards and my banks, surely that could be used for my own benefit. So do you know the feeling of when you have a fully stocked fridge, that moment of, hallelujah, <laughs> couldn't my supermarket fill my cart at items that I buy every fortnight at the price I'm prepared to pay? Couldn't my bank check that out and take it to my door, to take it into my kitchen and pack the fridge? You know, you know what I mean. But I guess that's what we're saying. That is the possibility for producers to really turn that value proposition around and use it for their own benefit. And if the Food and Retail Council, maybe they could lobby on my own behalf as well. I really want to thank um, the team. And this is the team up at the Armadale Smart Farm. Uh, we were very fortunate in having a great team that worked extremely hard. We did workshops all around the country um, and really, I think, have produced a really fundamentally important piece of work. Also, just quickly, would like to thank Rowan, who was the uh, project coordinator, kept us all on time and budget. So, thank you.